on this Friday night, protecting our most vulnerable from COVID-19. Ottawa falls short on its commitment to improve long-term care homes. We need funding. As calls grow for governments to intervene. A First Nations decades long crisis with dirty water. I've never had access to clean drinking water. I'm 50 years old. How is the mess going to be fixed? Why does it have to be like this? Competing visions for the future of the oil industry, how the race for the White House could affect Alberta. And once in a lifetime discovery, the songbird that has scientists so excited. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. COVID-19 cases are rising across the country now and it seems lessons learned from the first wave in the spring have not led to meaningful change in many long-term care homes. Despite promises to protect the most vulnerable, outbreaks are on the increase again. In Quebec, 44 long-term care facilities have at least one active case of COVID-19 now. Ontario is reporting active outbreaks in 77 long-term care homes. The problem is so concerning, Ontario's independent commission into long-term care felt compelled to release some of its recommendations early. Among them, not to delay fixing critical staffing shortages. It says a study on how to do that was released in July and that further study of the study is not necessary. What is required is timely implementation. As David Aiken reports in our top story tonight, it's not happening fast enough. In Quebec, the government has deployed what it described as SWAT teams to four long-term care homes where COVID-19 has come back. That province is determined not to repeat the scenes from the spring. In a virus that is so difficult to control, I think we've done a good job so far. Canada's top public health official says the outbreaks are different in this wave. What we have seen is that the numbers of long-term care facility outbreaks have increased, including in Quebec and in Ontario. The size of the outbreaks are smaller than in the initial um, wave. Exactly a month ago in the throne speech, the Trudeau government promised to help the provinces better protect those living in long-term care facilities, mostly by creating new national standards for care. So far though, no legislation has been put before parliament and developing national standards has only come up in passing on the bi-weekly calls the prime minister has with the premiers. And I think the first step and one of the advantages of a federation like Canada is we can learn from each other on how to deal with uh, particular challenges. Premiers are unanimous that the one thing Ottawa must do is give them more money for long-term health care. No problem at all sitting down with the federal government and coming up with a collaborative plan. But most of all, we, we need funding. Meanwhile, hospitals in Ontario are warning that elective surgeries may have to be cancelled because hospitals are being used to help manage the outbreak in long-term care homes. 200,000 elective surgery procedures were cancelled in the spring wave, and now hospitals are worried the same may happen in the fall wave. Donna? All right, David Aiken in Ottawa, thank you. We know the virus is spreading through communities and in some places it's moving too fast for contact tracers to break the chain of transmission. That is deeply worrying. Manitoba, which has the highest number of active cases per capita in Canada, reported 163 new cases today. 51 people are in the hospital there with the virus and that's a new record too. Most vulnerable again are people in long-term care homes. Brittany Greenslade reports from Winnipeg. It's home to Manitoba's deadliest care home outbreak, and the struggles at Parkview Place has doctors raising red flags. If I had parents there, I'd be concerned. The facility has 108 positive COVID-19 cases, including Winnipeg's latest death and the 15th at Parkview Place. Dr. Samir Sinha is a director of geriatrics at Mount Sinai Hospital in Toronto and says more needs to be done. Is this a tragedy? Absolutely. Were these deaths preventable? Absolutely. Were these deaths unavoidable? Absolutely not. A March inspection of the care home found major concerns with cleanliness and infection control. And Saturday's first in-person inspection since had health officials say there is an immediate need for more training on outbreak protocols. We're reliving an experience in Winnipeg right now at Parkview that we've seen repeatedly played out. And frankly, things that have taught us what not to do. 
In Ontario, an Ottawa long-term care home faced a similar outbreak with comparable numbers. More than 100 people linked to the West End Villa have tested positive for the virus, and 15 residents have died. The Ottawa hospital has since taken over patient care, a move Manitoba's health critic says should happen here. At this point, I think the government needs to step in, take over management, and make sure that residents, staff uh, are safe and receive the care and the resource that they deserve. But the province has no plans to take over care at Parkview Place. We don't have any uh, any immediate plans for, you know, for me to order uh, any uh, any place to be taken over. The province says instead, it will work on the home's staffing issues and providing extra resources. Brittany Greenslade, Global News, Winnipeg. There is some news tonight about vaccine research. The federal government is spending an additional $214 million to support Made in Canada vaccine research. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau warns he doesn't anticipate a vaccine will be ready until later next year at the earliest. Canada has spent more than $1 billion to secure millions of doses of a vaccine if a safe and effective one is developed. And deals have been struck with half a dozen pharmaceutical companies. The Prime Minister says Canada is now distributing hundreds of thousands of Abbott Labs rapid tests for COVID-19 across the country. He says it's now up to the provinces and territories to determine how the tests will be used as part of their testing strategies. The rapid tests can deliver results in as little as 13 minutes. In Quebec, more than 900 new COVID-19 cases were reported today. And there's a warning the health care system in the greater Quebec City area is on the brink of being overwhelmed. The region is under a partial lockdown. Bars, gyms and entertainment venues are shut. Indoor and outdoor gatherings outside of work settings are also banned. The province's deputy premier says the situation is critical and she had stern words for those not obeying the rules. Today, I want to be extremely frank and crystal clear with you. If we keep on the same track as we currently are going, as we currently are, we are going straight into a wall. The healthcare system will not even be able to take care of you anymore in some cases. Alberta's caseload keeps rising too. For the third day in a row, it set a record for daily new cases, 432. More than 100 people are in the hospital in Alberta and four more people have died from COVID-19. And next door in BC, 223 new cases were reported today. In Ontario, another Toronto hospital has declared an outbreak of COVID-19. Sunnybrook Hospital says five cases have been identified in a surgical unit. All infected patients are asymptomatic. One has since been released. Officials say the virus has not spread to other units. At least six Toronto hospitals are dealing with COVID-19 outbreaks. Promises are being made again to fix the grim water problem that has upended the lives of hundreds of people in an Ontario First Nation. The Neskanaga First Nation is a remote community about 430 kilometers northeast of Thunder Bay. For 25 years now, they've had to boil their drinking water, and now the water has been completely turned off because an oily substance was found in the water supply. Preliminary test results show high levels of hydrocarbons, a compound that can pose a health risk. Those who live there say it's shameful this can happen in Canada. Mike Lucature reports. This is what we're asked to, to live like this in Canada. Former chief of Nesconaga First Nation was getting water the only way that's safe in his community. Earlier this month, an oil sheen was spotted in the water reservoir. The treatment plant had to shut down and most members of the community were airlifted to Thunder Bay. We're living in a country that's very rich. Why does it have to be like this? I've never had access to clean drinking water. I'm uh, 50 years old. Chief Chris Munias is calling for a complete overhaul of the water system, saying the current situation can't continue. Young mothers go to the lake to scoop water from the lake so they can bait their children, so they can ration the bottled water that are, that's being provided. His community has been under a boil water advisory for 25 years. Now in 2015, the Trudeau Liberals promised an end to all water advisories on First Nations territories by March of 2021. The Prime Minister points out progress has been made, but he wouldn't directly address the issues at Nisconega. It is difficult, uh, as we all know, to end these long-term boil water advisories. Otherwise, other governments would have done it. 
A spokesperson for Indigenous Services Minister Mark Miller went a little further, saying efforts have been redoubled to help the community, adding, quote, the construction of the community's new water treatment plant is in its final stages. Upgrades to the waste water plant have been funded by ISC and are currently underway. Local leadership is refusing to let people back home until the federal government meets some basic demands, including making water available 24 hours a day, even if that means residents have to boil it first. Mike LeCouture, Global News, Ottawa. Tension is growing near Caledonia, Ontario. Protesters are holding their ground, defying a judge's order to permanently leave a construction site that's at the centre of a land dispute. <laughs> Members of the Six Nations of the Grand River expanded their blockade yesterday evening after an injunction was issued. Violence broke out. Police accused demonstrators of damaging one of their vehicles. Protesters say officers fired rubber bullets. Today, demonstrators blocked the road to the construction site with a bus. This is a red zone. There's to be no development here. I don't think that's very hard to understand. I'm not going to tolerate violence. You don't go after our police. You don't start burning telephone poles. You don't start digging up roads. That's unacceptable, and we won't tolerate it. The dispute over a subdivision began in late July. Demonstrators say the construction is happening on unceded Indigenous land and violates the First Nations' sovereignty. A group of major Canadian publishers is calling on the federal government to try and force Google and Facebook to pay their fair share for news content on their platforms. The media industry is facing big challenges right now, challenges made worse by the pandemic. Our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson explains what the issue is all about. News Media Canada, which represents Canadian newspapers, including the Toronto Star and the Globe and Mail, say that they are threatened by the dominance of the two big tech firms in the digital advertising market. A new report released Thursday lays out a number of recommendations which would make companies like Google or Facebook pay for news content on their platforms. The report calls on Ottawa to consider new regulations that would expand the intellectual property rights publishers can exercise over content and allow them to band together in a government-sanctioned collective bargaining unit. This is a monopoly problem. And, you know, historically, when markets have been faced with monopolies like this, governments have, have had to step in and... Um, and create a fair and equal play playing field. Google and Facebook control between 60 and 90 percent of the digital advertising market, which has become an increasingly vital source of revenue for the publishing industry. In a statement, Google says, the claim that Google owes hundreds of millions of dollars to the news industry is disappointingly unfounded. The News Media Canada report misrepresents how the internet has impacted news publishing and fails to account for those who have not managed to transform their business to the digital world. Canadian publishers have been fighting for compensation for news content on social media sites for years. The big U.S. tech firms have strongly opposed attempts in both Australia and France to introduce similar policies. Mercedes Stevenson, Global News, Ottawa. Late today, Facebook responded saying this report misrepresents the way that some of our products work. News organizations in Canada choose to post their content on Facebook to reach prospective subscribers, monetize their content and sell more advertising. Facebook says there are many ways to approach these complex issues and we want to work with news publishers and the government on a solution. A new way to vote in Pennsylvania. It is proving popular. Coming up, we explain why there could be some drawbacks. In 11 days, the eyes of the world will be on the U.S. for the presidential election. Millions of Americans have already cast their ballots in early voting. And in Pennsylvania, this is the first time revamped laws allow voters to request a mail-in ballot for any reason. There's been a surge in demand. And as Mike Armstrong explains, that could cause problems on election night. Pennsylvania has never voted for a president this way. It's called no excuse absentee voting. You request a ballot, fill it out, and either send it in, or as these people are doing, drop it off in person. There you go, a proud Thank citizen. You. I love the early drop off. I think it's the best thing that could have happened to us. I see it, ha I don't see it going away. When the state overhauled its early voting system last year, pre-pandemic, it didn't know how popular it would be. It also didn't know how complicated it would end up being. 
Pennsylvania had about 6 million votes cast in the last election. This time around, it's had close to 3 million requests for early voting ballots. Election officials are already warning there may be problems when the counting starts and urging patience. Obviously, the closer the race, the longer it will take to know who the winner is. This part of the election is called canvassing the ballots. The first issue is that under Pennsylvania's new system, officials are only allowed to start counting ballots November 3rd once the polls closed. Even ballots that arrived weeks ago can't be counted in advance. It's also a slow process. Some have suggested that it won't just take days, but it could be weeks until the elections are certified. Now, that's just the counting. Add to it the legal wrangling that's ramping up. This new system was brought in by the Democratic governor, and Republican lawyers have been fighting for weeks, everything from poll locations to poll observers to postmarks. Pennsylvania will count ballots received up to three days after the election. Republicans wanted them rejected if they arrived late. That fight went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court just this week. Good to see you all. Well, there's a lot to be gained by rejecting early ballots because they're most likely votes for Joe Biden. Of the 2.9 million requests for early ballots in Pennsylvania, 63% were from registered Democrats, 1.8 million. Registered Republicans were less than half as many, only 700,000. The ballot is stacked in a pile to be counted. Now, last month, a state election official warned 100,000 votes could be rejected over mistakes in how they're sent in. Well, in 2016, Donald Trump won Pennsylvania by just 44,000 votes. Rejected ballots could have a major impact on the results. Mike Armstrong, Global News, Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Still ahead, the big buzz in Washington state over murder hornets. You're watching Global National. We're about to go into a dark winter, a dark winter. And he has no clear plan. We're learning to live with it. We have no choice. We can't lock ourselves up in a basement like Joe does. Well, in case you missed it, the second and final debate between the American presidential candidates was more dignified than the first, in part perhaps because they knew their mics could be muted. Donald Trump and Joe Biden tackled a range of topics, including climate change. And the contrast between them on that issue is stark. As Eric Sorensen reports, what Biden said about the future of oil could have implications on the outcome of the U.S. election and on Canada. For Donald Trump, it was a rare opening to try to separate Joe Biden from voters in oil country. Would you close down the oil industry? By the way, I would transition from the oil industry, yes. Oh, I will that's transition. A it is a big statement. That's it a is a climate era reality check. Texas alone has more than 350,000 jobs in the oil sector. Other states have fracking, and Trump knows they are swing states with close races. He is Mr. going President? to destroy the oil industry. Okay. Will you remember that, Texas? Will you okay. remember that, Pennsylvania, Oklahoma? Vice President it's Biden. sensitive. One Oklahoma Democratic congresswoman tweeted, here's one of the places Biden and I disagree. We must stand up for our oil and gas industry. Biden later offered reassurance. We're going to get rid of the subsidies for fossil fuels, but we're not going to get rid of fossil fuels for a long time. Climate change hasn't been the main issue, but a Biden presidency could be a defining moment, says this academic. It's something that people need to hear, both in the United States and in Canada, which is that we are going to be making a transition away from fossil fuels. Watching closely, Canada's oil industry. Alberta is spending millions to construct the Keystone XL pipeline. It would run from Alberta to refineries on the Texas Gulf Coast. A presidential permit for the Keystone XL pipeline. Trump approved the Keystone permit three years ago. Biden has pledged to cancel it. Alberta's premier aims to change Biden's mind if he's elected president. We're going to point out, should there be a change of administration, that uh, the uh, United States needs a safe, secure, reliable source of energy. Will that work? No, I don't think so. I think the um, premier of Alberta is uh, projecting what he would what he would like to see. Instead, I think he should be listening closely to what Biden said last night. It was five years ago that President Obama first decided to block construction of Keystone XL. Who would have thought the man in the background might ultimately be the one who would stop it once and for all? Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. 
And because it's 2020, there's news tonight about murder hornets. Officials in Washington state have found the first nest of Asian giant hornets in the U.S. They found it in a tree on private property in Blaine, Washington. That's about 50 kilometers south of the B.C. border. They'd been searching for it because a few of the hornets were sighted in the area. A couple were tagged with radio trackers and ended up in this nest. It will be destroyed, and it's hoped the hornets will be eradicated because... A group of 30 of them can decapitate tens of thousands of bees in only a few hours. Hence the name, Murder Hornet. Next, a rare non-binary bird in Pennsylvania. Today at Powder Mill, we caught a really cool bird. Researchers say finding this cool bird is a bit like finding a unicorn. It is half male and half female. It's a rose-breasted grosbeak, a common species, but researchers at the Nature Reserve in Pennsylvania say its plumage reveals something remarkable. It has colors of both a male and female, pink under its right wing, which is the male color, and yellow, the female color, under its left wing. The condition is known as bilateral gynandromorphism. It's thought to stem from an error during egg formation, and it's extremely rare in birds. And because it's Friday, let's keep going with the strange bird theme. At a Dutch zoo, an African penguin couple, both of them male, stole an entire nest of eggs from another penguin couple, both of them female. Zookeepers say homosexuality is fairly common in penguins, and they often give eggs to same-sex penguin couples that show signs of wanting a chick. But the penguins don't usually go ahead and steal the eggs themselves. And that is Global National for this Friday. I'm Donna Friesen, and that's it for the birds. Tonight's Your Canada is Elbow Falls in Bragg Creek, Alberta, where the foothills turn into the Rockies. There are beautiful spots all over Canada. Please email yours to viewers at globalnational.com. Thanks for watching. Robin Gill will be here over the weekend, and I will see you back here on Monday. Have a lovely weekend. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.